We're going to start uh, with a presentation from uh, the director of Public Health Seattle King County, Patty Hayes, who has been very gracious to join us tonight. She has been leading King County's response to the COVID-19 pandemic for about a year now. And that's a year of seven day weeks and who knows how many hour days. Uh, and so the fact that she is able and willing to spend her time to come and talk to us all tonight, I am just so grateful for her expertise and her time. Um, she's gonna give us a presentation which will include some PowerPoint information. It'll take about 20 minutes or so. And then that's gonna leave hopefully a full 30, 35 minutes for Q and A to get to your questions. I really wanna to get to as many of them as we can. Both questions that were written in advance have been collected and I have staff here, I wanna introduce them to you. You may see Krista Commonson, she's my chief of staff, and Madeline Cavazos, who works in my office, who has put this all together, has been collecting your questions, and will help me to make sure that we stay on top of answering them, as many of them as we possibly can tonight. Um, please note this event is being recorded. We wanted to record it for posterity and also so that we can put the recording up for people who couldn't make it or who missed part of it, you can watch it later. And uh, with that, I just will hand it off to Director Hayes. Patty, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you so much. Uh, so appreciate this opportunity uh, to be uh, with you all this, uh, this evening, actually. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm happy to share the information we have. I am committed to, to transparency and getting information out uh, this has been such an amazing and uh, really uh, traumatic journey for everyone in uh, King County and indeed our state and our country. A pandemic that uh, is nothing anybody has seen in generations. And uh, not only that, a pandemic where the virus uh, is uh, so quirky and we're learning so much about it and that can lead to uh, what I call uh, live action science, <laughs> that you're watching it emerge and we change our strategies. We do the work uh, live time as we learn about the virus. And having been ground zero with almost uh, a year ago, a year ago next month, when uh, we had the outbreak at the life care uh, facility, uh, we know that uh, that was the start of this journey for the country. So I want to start tonight, and I am going to screen share a couple of things. I, I do want to start with just a moment about where we're at with the outbreak. So I have a, a chart from today's report, actually. Uh, I clipped it so you would have the latest because even with the hope of vaccines and that light at the end of the tunnel, we know that this is still a long journey, and I want you to have uh, the latest information on uh, the, where we're at with the outbreak. So this is uh, a data uh, that is on our dashboard. We have a number of great dashboards on our website, uh, and uh, this one shows the seven day moving average of new cases. And we look at new cases by the date of the test result. And we do that because then public health can look at when the infectious period was. And so you'll see that we had a, a spike of cases in and around Thanksgiving time. And then we had this reduction until uh, the holiday season in December. And now, since the 9th of January, we have seen uh, another decrease. And there's still data coming in for these last data points. So this might not quite be that sharp as you see right here. But Dr. Duchin and I are confident to say we are seeing a trail off of this so that we're averaging somewhere around 300 to 350 cases a day, which is indeed much better <clears throat> excuse me, than we were uh, at the peak, but <clears throat> it's still at a level that we need everyone to continue the key strategies that you hear uh, discussed by Dr. Duchin and others and great support from you. It's your work in the community to wear a mask, 
to be physically distant, to keep your gathering small, to not uh, uh, go out unless you have to, to keep uh, your uh, areas clean, that these things, these strategies are what have credited us to doing as well as we can. And I um, also want to say that I am just so grateful that in King County, we have not seen uh, the hospitalization problem uh, and the overrunning of our hospital system that we have in other areas of the country. And that's again because of your great efforts and our community rallying, our business community rallying, uh, the support from all of our elected officials. The unity here we have had um, really has made us one of the best counties in the country. That doesn't mean that our work is done or that uh, it, we can't do more, do better, but uh, compared to other areas around the country, uh, we have really done well. So bringing vaccines in now uh, to the system and working together on that is our next uh, uh, big both challenge and opportunity as, as we move uh, into this new year. So I'm gonna now uh, do a slide deck around the vaccines. Uh, I will make that large so you can see it. So uh, this is our King County Unified uh, Regional Strategy for Vaccine Delivery. Uh, I have uh, had the opportunity to present this at council, so you're getting um, the information that was just recently given. So our goal here, obviously, is to get, the, to, get to the end of the tunnel where we're uh, not seeing COVID spread uh, and we get it under control. We want to do that uh, by reaching a level that Dr. Duchin has set that reaches 70% of the eligible population for who can receive the vaccines. And what I mean by that is the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine have not been approved for uh, youth and children under the age of 16. So the eligible population we want to reach to get that uh, level towards what's called herd immunity is 70%. So we need to reach one and a quarter million adults, starting with those who are highest risk. So I'd like to briefly discuss the different roles. You know that the federal government has really struggled with everything from the plan to the distribution to knowing uh, the, the vaccine, the amount of vaccine. Uh, I think with the new uh, Biden administration, we're already seeing uh, today that further doses of vaccine uh, were already uh, purchased for stability at the federal level so that we can um, get some, uh, we can count on our vaccine uh, allocation more than we can right now, and I'll come to that in a minute. The State Department of Health is uh, responsible for what's called enrolling providers. In order to deliver this vaccine, because the handling of it, the mixing of it, uh, all requires special handling for these vaccines, they have to approve those providers. So most of the hospital systems are approved providers. Many of your uh, clinics are approved providers. Uh, the community health centers are becoming approved providers, and of course, Public Health Seattle King County is approved provider. The state sets uh, the prioritization and also the allocation. They distribute, they're setting up rep statewide reporting systems, and of course, the public information campaign. So our role here is to work with partners to develop the operational plan to reach priority populations, to look for gaps and to make sure we're addressing those gaps. And particularly with uh, community and our uh, black indigenous pop population and our communities of color to build the relationships so that uh, we know that, they, that there is a disparity in the experience of COVID infections in that community just because 
uh, they uh, have related health disparities that we want to make sure that uh, we are paying attention to the delivery of vaccines in those communities. So here uh, is the, the six multimodal vaccine delivery plan. It builds off of the healthcare system. The healthcare system has been receiving vaccines and uh, the first uh, priority group, which was 1A that you've heard about, that was uh, uh, first, first uh, and foremost, the frontline healthcare workers, not just nurses and doctors, but also the folks that are working in the COVID units and emergency rooms uh, who are uh, uh, being exposed every day. And then the other healthcare workers in external clinics. I'm very pleased to say that 80% uh, of the nursing personnel in King County have been vaccinated. 75% of the physician uh, population has been vaccinated. So we have been, we have exceeded uh, the rest of the state in vaccinating the, the, those 1A priority providers. We are still working to make sure that our EMS uh, folks all get vaccinated. They have been uh, such an amazing force, our first responder system, both in uh, keeping our system going as well as helping us with testing uh, and uh, our mass vaccination sites. And then, um, the long-term care system, and I'll get back to that in just a minute. So pharmacies are a key provider. Uh, your local pharmacies will eventually have doses and um, there, there is a key role for them because they have, they're used to giving the flu vaccine and other vaccinations and the state is contracting with them. But right now, the key role that they're serving is there is a federal program for long-term care facilities so that uh, the most vulnerable populations, and that's where we've had the highest level of deaths is in uh, the 75 and above population, and also in these congregate settings like nursing homes, assisted living, and, long, and then adult family homes. So we have 100% of our, uh, of our nursing homes are affiliated with this uh, pharmacy uh, program with the federal government. They are getting shots in arms right now. Uh, I'm very excited to see uh, the data as we go forward that we are protecting this population where we still are having outbreaks and, and, and the majority of deaths are coming from uh, that, uh, that sector. Employer-based vaccination clinics are gonna be very important. Uh, many of the large employers in particular are, are developing plans for uh, workplace and site delivery. That's not going to happen right away because our biggest limitation is the doses. But uh, when uh, we get to the phase where the general population is receiving vaccines, these employer-based vaccination clinics, we want them ready to stand up. And also for some employers who are very large and could help serve the population to also open their doors and uh, help outside of just their employees. Then high volume community-based vaccination hubs. You've probably heard the governor talk about this and there have been some that have been opened up. Uh, these are open access. They can be drive-through or walk-up. We will be uh, opening up two of these uh, uh, and uh, first in the South County. Uh, but in, um, in this district, uh, actually there is a uh, arrangement happening between Overlake and Microsoft that is again making sure that we're reaching all those uh, 1A population, but they are using it to model uh, an open vaccine uh, hub so that uh, it could be, as we get more doses, used uh, as, as a hub. Then we have mobile vaccination teams. Uh, we're setting up right now 10 teams. These teams are traveling uh, to the adult family homes, to places where uh, it really, uh, 
uh, is essential that uh, the uh, older adults in those settings really shouldn't probably leave to go get a vaccine somewhere else. They're homebound or they're in adult family homes. They're frail. They shouldn't leave. So we are taking the vaccine to, to them. Then those mobile teams will be able to serve other places, uh, uh, homeless shelters, uh, uh, and other uh, supportive housing. And then we want to do pop-up clinics as well. Our goal is that the elements to move quickly is that we first and foremost need to get a robust, steady, and stable stream of doses, which we have not had. And I'll show you a chart for that in just a sec. And then we need the staffing and infrastructure. And that's why these partnerships between business and the healthcare system with public health working to make sure everything uh, can be uh, available throughout the county. And then uh, what should be an easy to use system for scheduling appointments, which is a, a major failure right now, as I know a number of you have experienced. So here's the timing of our scenario. We want to complete the vaccination of this one and a quarter million uh, people in King County. So this is based on our best information on what the federal government believes would be our allocation. You can see that January is very low. February is when we want to start setting up the mass vaccination sites and mobile units. That's just next week. Um, and with the Biden administration's announcement today, I'm hoping that that will solidify and accelerate this. This is an important slide um, that we're going to have more and more visible ongoing. This gives you a week by week uh, overview of what, the, what Washington State received, what King County received, and then how we're uh, looking at dose one and dose two, because I know there was a question about making sure dose two was available. And I know people are concerned about that. One of the things we've done is to make sure that we look at the total we're getting and that w uh, we have uh, counted for where we need dose two. But if you'll see the difference between week six and week seven, it will show you our challenge. One of the things that is a problem that I believe the new administration is going to quickly try and solve is that the State Department of Health only finds out what allocation of vaccine the state's going to be receiving on a one week notice. So that means King County is notified on Fridays as to what our allocation is going to be the next week. That makes it almost impossible to do forward planning with our partners, our hospitals, uh, and then these open clinics that we want to put forward. We saw that happen uh, actually uh, this week, and you can see the drop from last week we got 73,000, this week we only got 38,000. What that mean, meant was a number of our providers had to relook at their schedule. And they, some of them are considering whether or not they have to cancel appointments or bump them out a week. So this causes a lot of frustration. My apologies to, to you all that this is a situation we're in. Um, the allocation to King County, again, we get it one week in advance and then we plan. We're hoping that with the change here that's coming, that we'll get a, a longer view of this, some, some stability. And uh, this morning, there was an announcement that the governor is hoping that we will see a 15% increase per week. We'll have to see how that pans out. That would be very helpful to stabilize this. So the first thing it would do, you can tell, is to stabilize uh, back up to that six week amount uh, as we get more doses and then allow us to expand. So one of the challenges that has happened with some of, uh, and possibly when you've tried to schedule an appointment with your provider, is that uh, they have created waiting lists uh, or they have uh, scheduled 
before they actually know they're going to get doses. So again, uh, just so you know, that's, that's what is stumbling right now. So the core elements of this region-wide success is that we know that we are um, one of the best counties at getting doses in and getting them out. Um, we have gotten uh, dose, and, and also one of the roles that King County Public Health plays is uh, if there are doses that need to be moved, if a provider is saying that they aren't going to be able to use those doses, that we have a list for where those doses can be shifted. So we're working with the State Department of Health to make sure that they're working closely with us so that uh, doses get uh, into people's arms. Uh, and Dr. Duchin reported just this afternoon that uh, the data he's looked at is showing that we are actually uh, moving vaccine very quickly through and that the doses that have not been registered there is some data delay and also uh, he's confident that providers are holding back just the amount that's necessary to complete their, their week's clinics and vaccination goals so that nobody is uh, holding back vaccines. The one piece of this that's a bit of a wild card is the state doesn't have visibility into the doses that uh, the um, pharmacies are getting to work with nursing homes. And I know the nursing homes, uh, some of them have felt that the pharmacies have been a little slow. So I know that they're working on that uh, right now. So with that, I'm going to stop my screen share and we can start moving to questions if you'd like, council member. Great, thank you. Uh, I don't think there's a way to spotlight the two of us, so I think you're gonna stay big and I'm gonna be asking you questions oh, okay. from my little tile up here. And we're, this is our first time using this technology, so I hope that's okay with you. Um, well, we have been receiving a lot of questions, and so I'm gonna just start taking them in uh, order of what feels like, you know, something that makes sense of flow. Um, I think the first one, and it goes sort of way back to the beginning, is some of the early questions we received uh, in advance of this are, uh, some people have questions about the vaccine's safety, and they wanna know that the vaccine is safe and that they could feel confident taking it. And so, can you just speak a little bit about that? Absolutely, and that is such an essential question. Uh, we actually have information on our website on the technology that was used to develop these new vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna. So uh, that's available for any of you that want to, to deep dive a little bit more. These vaccines that have been uh, produced this year have followed the rigors that any new vaccine has to follow. And the phase three trials were in depth and actually we're very fortunate with Dr. Duchin. He's one of the leading uh, infectious disease uh, physicians in the country. He has participated with ongoing conversations nationally uh, about the development of these vaccines. He has been very confident about the, the rigor of the trials and the FDA approval process. Uh, and his uh, conversations with CDC about their process uh, of approval and, and bringing these vaccines on. So um, he was very impressed that both of these vaccines are 95% effective. And that is just outstanding for a new, brand new vaccine. And the technology of this is really important. Uh, it is an an mRNA, uh, and I am not uh, Dr. Duchin to explain this, but basically this is new technology that actually trains your body to know the coronavirus so that you can build up immunity to it. So unlike other vaccines that were built off of the actual virus, this is a new technology that works with your body in a different way. And so it doesn't affect your DNA. It doesn't, uh, it's not attenuated virus uh, that some other vaccines are. And he feels it's, it's 
very safe and doesn't have any residuals in the in the body. So of course, uh, they have to study and find out how long these vaccines are going to be effective. Do we have to have a booster at some at some time, and particularly with the new variants that are coming up. They're studying this as fast as possible, but the two vaccines that we are uh, giving out right now uh, seem to be going uh, very well. A series of questions we received have to do with priorities. How are they set? And then whether we understand some of the situations that people have that don't fit neatly into the priorities. So I'm just gonna ask the, the general question, how do the priorities get set? And then maybe hit upon some specific uh, uh, interest that people have in, in the priorities? Yes, a really important question, because how do people know where they're at in line if they don't know how the priorities are set? So um, actually at the federal level, there is a committee that deals with vaccines that uh, is always looking at vaccines and the priorities for those. So just like their regular work when these vaccines came on, they made a set of recommendations to the CDC uh, for the vaccine priorities. And it was based upon a set of criteria, one being, of course, who is the most vulnerable? Where are we seeing the largest morbidity and mortality? Who is dying from uh, COVID? And then also looking at how do we protect our healthcare system? So the faster we protect the healthcare system, both by vaccinating those folks who would end up in the healthcare system as well as the healthcare workers. Uh, so those two emerge as the top of the phase priorities. So those recommendations come down to the state and then it's actually the responsibility of the state to set the priorities. So they set the 1A and now you're hearing about the 1B1, uh, which uh, are folks 65 and over or people who are 50 or over living in multi-generational housing. And then 1B2 will begin to get into essential workers, which is a huge category that the governor has signaled that when we get to that point, because of uh, some of this definitional issue that, that I think some of, of your constituents are mentioning here, where I don't quite fit easily into this definition, I think the governor, when we get to that, that uh, that group, uh, which I hope if we get more vaccine, maybe next month, um, will uh, allow some flexibility. So for the, the example I can give is, if we have a mobile team going out to a congregate setting, it would be really inefficient in that congregate setting to say, are you this kind of worker and are you this age or do you have these vulnerabilities? You have everybody there. Would it be possible to look at the whole congregate setting at the same time? So I think some of these phases, especially when we get down to essential workers and then other folks who are 50 and above with uh, health conditions, you'll see that, that the governor's going to probably talk more about some flexibility with that is what I'm expecting. But right now we're focused on the uh, 65 and older or 50 and older uh, who are in multi-generational housing. That's what uh, is um, being uh, focused on right now. I think that's helpful to know where the, where the priorities come from. And then um, the issues people have are are so fascinating and also somewhat heartbreaking, right? Um, so there are some people we've heard from who will say that they're in tier 1A or they're in tier 1B, which means they are people who have are at the highest risk and really need to get the vaccine for their safety and will say to us, um, please don't let folks in lower tiers get the vaccines until we do, because then we'll be competing with that huge group of people who comes in next and, and we're the ones at the most risk. So you can understand where a person like that is coming from. You know, at the same time, there's all this demand. So we have, at King County, we have bus drivers who are out there working with people every day. We have grocery store clerks. You'll see there's at least a couple of questions we've had here about teachers. And that's a hot topic here in Bellevue, uh, anybody on the line who's got kids in the Bellevue School District like I do knows that we have had a rocky road of it the last week or so because of 
the concerns that teachers have about going back in person as the school district was trying to transition some of the younger grades back and they ended up having a labor dispute essentially and some of us had our school canceled over it it was like a free snow day or something so i don't know where the questions there but the questions are probably what can we do to try to elevate people who we need to be vaccinated in order for the community to work better and then i guess on the countervailing side of that how do we protect the people who need the vaccine the most and that's why they are in the high priority i don't know that's a lot of stuff all at once but whatever you, you can help us with there well i i would say you have well laid out the conversations that are so frustrating to everyone so first i want to acknowledge that it's been a long haul and everybody is extremely tired of this and the faster we can get through it the better for everybody for our economy for our children uh, for our families mm -hmm. what i can say is that regardless of the vaccine being here one of the things we have to do is to support each other and support our neighbors and our families to continue to wear a mask and protect yourself and not just count on the vaccine. Because, uh, and you'll hear Dr. Duchin speak of this uh, every week, that, you know, we will have to continue protecting ourselves for, for the time being till, till he's confident we've gotten through this, that there's not some sort of other, uh, I call them dust balls that all of a sudden comes up uh, and causes us to take a step back because none of us want to take a step back. I think that these phases have been very well thought out uh, by, uh, the, the, by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention and actually our own State Department of Health. And I know that um, we all want to get the most vulnerable, peop vulnerable people vaccinated as fast as possible. And it is fine lines between uh, a bus driver and a sheriff and uh, lots of the folks in that 1B essential worker piece. This is why it's essential for us to be ready to set up large scale uh, uh, vaccinations so that when we get the vaccine, we can get it out. Because right now, based upon the chart I just showed you, we're not going to get through the seven, the 65 and above group uh, very quickly if right. we get the dribs and drabs, and then we have to make sure people get their second dose. Yeah. So um, that's, that's the hall we're, we're dealing with right now. We're hearing from people uh, that are eligible now, so in the those categories, those early 1A, 1B categories, who are getting appointments in March. So I think so to the extent uh, that people are framing the question as when, uh, what I'm hearing is we really won't be moving into a much bigger phase than we're at today for at least six weeks or so, I mean, or more. And so at, at this stage, so I think I'm hearing a caution to patients a little bit and we're all really anxious and feeling impatient. I mean, it just, I mean, I, I don't even start to think about where I or my family come in because we're not, we don't fall into any categories that would cause us to move up the list and that's fine, but so we, we just haven't even been looking. Uh, last thing about uh, priorities, maybe, maybe actually two more things about priorities. One is you see in the, in the chat that some people have asked about people living in correctional facilities and people working in correctional facilities, and then people who are living in homelessness, living in their cars, living on the streets. So can you talk a little bit about um, priority and like priority first, but then we'll get to how do we get the people to get the vaccines uh, in the next set of questions. Right, so uh, essential workers in those congregate settings are part of where people are in line to get this. So Public Health Seattle King County actually for the county run uh, jails, the two county run jails, Public Health Seattle King County actually provides the healthcare services there. So those are frontline health workers who are working uh, in those settings. So those would have been in the 1A mm -hmm. uh, and 
the correctional facilities that are under DOC, um, the state should be allocating uh, doses somehow directly within DOC. And I don't have a visibility into that, mm -hmm. but I know there has been concern about some outbreaks in uh, some of our work release programs here in mm -hmm. King County. My team has been doing consultation and site visits and uh, infection control procedures in those facilities. So um, we have been in a lot of conversations with the State Department of Health about those. For our own, what we're doing uh, is making sure that we're aggressively testing. We have had one of the lowest uh, outbreak uh, problems in our jails uh, from around the whole entire country. And I really credit the support we've had uh, from folks like you, council member, thank you, uh, as we quickly put in lots of testing and protective measures uh, for those workers so that when they are ready in line to get their vaccine, we've already had a, a history of doing good good uh, protocols in those uh, settings. Uh, thank you. I want to try to go back and forth because I'm feeling for you. As somebody who sits on a video screen that's being broadcast for hours on end, uh, I, I feel like you've been up there for a long time, so I'll, I'll take over for a moment. Uh, the, the other question about priority uh, before we move on to the next category of questions is uh, some folks have asked about family members. So if you are a person who falls into a category that is high priority, um, if you, uh, if we do get around to vaccinating teachers and then they come home to family members that don't fall into a high priority, doesn't it make sense to maybe think about vaccinating the family members because that they'll infect each other? And so I know you've talked about the, the, um, multi, um, generational, multi-generational yeah. families, but this is about like just spouses. Uh, I go to work, I'm a, I'm a worker, I, I'm to 2a or whatever you know whatever level i'm at but i come home to a spouse who is not uh, is there any thought given to uh inoculating spouses as a priority with their with their spouse or other family members who live together yeah i'm sure the state department of health had a, a lively debate on this and um when they landed on the priorities it was really based on initial risk and um and their recommendations have held firm that you know if you're in a household that you need to protect each other uh, and our healthcare workers who are likely to get exposed and then bring it home the faster we deal with those folks then you are in a sense protecting those other family members yeah. uh, uh, by that because of the high possibility of that person bringing it in so yeah. I don't believe with the current vaccine allocation, the very small amount we're getting, we, we couldn't possibly, uh, I don't believe the state would open it any wider to anybody else in the family who isn't in that category. I think that's sort of the bottom line when we talk about these things is that as long as the allocations remain as relatively tiny as they are, um, it's hard to talk about expanding because we can't even vaccinate the people who are currently a priority. Right. And then just to close out this section, I, I want to share just a little story. And this is for everybody, not just for Patty. Uh, one of the emails I got today that just kind of underscored for me how terribly hard the decisions are that have to be made about priority. Um, I didn't ask for permission to share people's stories, so I'm going to de-identify this person. But a woman wrote, uh, she's uh, she's older, I, 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 upper 80s or maybe 90, and at risk, so not just in the age group that is a high priority, but also medically at risk, and caring for a developmentally disabled child, grown child, um, but because that child is not 50 yet, and because she is caring for him and not the other way around, he doesn't qualify to get the vaccine, so she'll have to go for herself when she can get herself the vaccine, and then she'll have to take him at some later time. And that's just, these are just the hard results of having to ration, frankly. And, and it, it breaks my heart. I wish I could just fix it for that person. But, and there's just so many stories. I mean, so many, like, that's just not by far the only one. That was just one that we saw today that was very, very moving to me. 
Okay, uh, let's move on to how do I get a vaccination? This is like a whole list of questions and probably by far the most popular uh, problem uh, that people are having. Um, even if you go to find your phase, you determine that you are eligible, you print out your piece of paper, you're ready to go, people are hitting a brick wall. They're trying to call their own healthcare providers and either there's very little information or there's information but there's no appointments. We've heard about people who get appointments and then they get canceled. Uh, and a whole lot about people who get appointment for dose number one but are very worried about or having a hard time even getting information from the same people who gave them dose one about will there be a dose two and when. So I think on some level, this is a statement about the fragmented nature of our healthcare system. There are these private providers, we all have, you know, and we don't all, but many of us have one. There are public providers, public health and in and, and, and you all, um, and you, provide care to a mission population of folks who don't have ready access to private health insurance or private health care, but there's no one place for people to go. And so over and over, we've heard about folks like they're staying up late at night, they're getting up early in the morning, they're spending hours on the internet looking for appointments. And it's just terribly frustrating. You acknowledge this and I acknowledge, I mean, we all have to acknowledge it's terribly frustrating. Are you aware of, or is there any way that we can encourage the state to work with us to try to get that this more reliable, a more reliable, easier to access system. So that's question one. Like, can we pull it together somehow so that it's not quite such a, an effort for people to have to try to just find an appointment? Yeah, this is a, a, a total example of the fragmentation in the healthcare system. And indeed, actually, a failure from the federal level that uh, this problem was not identified. When the federal uh, government initially was asking states to put together a vaccine plan, it actually, I, I was on calls where some of the rhetoric federally was states don't need any uh, coordination or money to pull us off. There was this mystical thinking, if I can use that term, that somehow the healthcare system would just do it. And right away, it just totally focused me because I knew this would be a failure coming here. So one of the things that we, I just have to admit is that phase finder is not working well right now. This was the state's attempt to try and get you some technology. First of all, it makes you, you know, it assumes everybody knows how to really work one of these really well. Um, and that's not the case for everybody, uh, me included. Uh, but secondly, when, when we were talking with the state, it was clear that they didn't understand the customer experience that we would want to go on there, get our information, and then if we qualified, we need to not just have to go somewhere else, but be linked in to get an appointment. And so with the new Secretary of Health, Dr. Umer Shah, who comes from us from uh, the Harris County uh, area in Texas, he has immediately, and as you heard the governor announce today, they've stood up uh, a huge uh, public-private partnership and just brought on a staff, uh, actually from PATH, uh, to run that. And uh, actually, uh, we've had teams from Microsoft and Starbucks just be loaned in right now to the state to try and deal with this. Because the state set up FaceFinder and then they set up a separate uh, reporting mechanism where your physician or your clinic or your hospital has to report in when you get the vaccine. And these two things don't connect. So you can't make the appointment and then your provider can report it out. And then it automatically reminds you of the second dose. Ideally, that's how the system should run. So what we're doing here in King County um, to try and, and deal with this right now for the, the folks that are in that 65 and older, we're literally uh, tonight <laughs> starting 
a process where we're contacting the organizations that have the case managers who are working with vulnerable adults who are isolated to call them and try and make sure that we are contacting people in that age range. Knowing that the hospitals and uh, other systems are like Kaiser, it's trying to set up an appointment system for their own patients. We're trying to put this patchwork together. I heard one of our healthcare system had a 35,000 person waiting list. 35,000. I mean, what do you do with that? Those are not even people that got their first notice and got a first appointment. They're just on a waiting list. They feel in limbo. So this is going to go on for a while while the state tries to fix phase finder. And then the healthcare system tries to figure out how to work together. I've been really proud of Overlake reaching out to Microsoft. Um, and I know that Costco is really interested in helping in this space. So, so we have willing people. Uh, it's, a, it's around connecting. I had my team go down to look at some modeling that uh, some of the executives uh, from Starbucks and Microsoft have been doing to not only for the flow of how you get people through when we do uh, mass vaccination uh, type work, but also to, to really uh, use a different approach for the customer service so that people can actually get from appointment to vaccine, to reminder, to the second vaccine. So this is going to be a work in progress, but I'm really, I'm really proud of King County and the employers we have here because they're really stepping up. And I think that the partnership that's emerging with Overlake and what I think you're going to see in the Redmond area soon, it's going to be a model. Uh, and, and we want to replicate that model. Yeah, I hope so. And this is one of those topics. We could talk about this one all night. And I know that uh, folks would love it if we could just say, call this number and you'll get your appointment. Uh, what I'm hearing is we are where we are. Uh, there will come a time, by the way, I've said this to a lot of folks, folks. I have said there will come a time when we need to look backwards and say, how did we get here? And how do we make sure we get ready better? Uh, for future crises, and it doesn't just have to be this kind, it can be others, we can learn a lot from it. Right now, we need to get from where we are to where we need to be, and I'm really glad to hear that partnerships are forming to do that, because we just need coordination. People need more coordination so that it's not, it's so that it's not a roulette, as folks are saying. So, um, the, uh, the, the last set of questions I guess I will ask is um, about information and where, where we can get information. And I just want to read one uh, from the Q&A because it struck me as being just really well stated. Um, the major medical systems don't seem to have much of an actual comms plan. Uh, our family is in Overlake, Swedish, UW, and Evergreen systems with eligible folks in all four. So far, only Evergreen has had a concrete plan of how they'll let their patient list know about the VAX. Right now, it's a free-for-all and providers have no idea how their parent, parent, patients sorry, will be getting information. Not information about the vaccine itself, but about the process. And the question is, we have access to comm plans that we can share. And I'm gonna just jump in and say, I think that what's happening is we're just now starting to see coalescing of the various different organizations coming together. The good news is whenever I ask Patty, are you working with so-and-so? We had a request about Evergreen or Overlake or whatever. They're always, they're talking to each other. They're sharing information. Everybody wants to cooperate and help. There's been some interesting partnerships starting to form. You saw that one Amazon pop-up mass injection site that they had. And you know, truthfully, I'm not a huge fan of the pop-up mass injection site because that is appointment roulette, like, where is it today? I want something more orderly and reliable for people. But I just want to put it out there that the information itself. So we've had some questions about find your face. And um, so one of them is, and, and we can actually, this is a question that can be answered, uh, William. So we'll get an answer to you. I, I don't know that we need, we have it right here. But 
people who go through find your phase and get the answer, you are eligible. It's reportedly not telling them which phase and some places it matters. Some places only want one A or, and so people need to know what phase. So that's, let's put that aside for now. We'll get an answer to that separately. Um, the question I have is for the rest of us, it says you're not eligible and then it stops. And so that is the app equivalent of saying, don't call us, we'll call you, give us your phone number, we'll let you know when. And I really, really think, and I've said this, Patty's nodding because she's heard me say this before. The system should then direct people to someplace else where um, it tells you, given what you've told us, you are currently phase three or whatever, making it up. And we know that there's not gonna, we're not gonna get to phase three for, for a while. Like, it's disappointing, people won't like to hear it, but we'd rather know, like I'd rather know. Um, that's, anyway, that's more of a speech than a question. Here's a question I want to ask, it comes from Angie Hinojosa, and let me find it again, I had it up a moment ago. Um, it's about information sharing with the Latino community. Uh, Angie is the director of Centro Cultural Mexicano in Redmond, and she asked, um, she says, as a caregiver in a Mexican-American multi-generational household, I can say that information on vaccine availability is not necessarily getting out to our Latino households. More partnerships with community organizations in various languages is needed. What is the plan to educate and inform our Latino communities who have been hard hit? And I will add to that, who have been the hardest hit. I mean, the data shows that the Latino community has gotten the most infections na nationwide, not just here, and, and, and a very high level of mortality. So there's a reason that we need to sort of focus and, and really help that community. But what can you tell us, uh, if anything, about how we're engaging with those communities that are harder to get information to? Yeah, thanks for that. And I'll uh, ask uh, Ann, who's helping me out tonight, to be sure and get your name and get you plugged in, because we actually have, uh, a, 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 we have our pandemic uh, advisory committee that is uh, basically represents uh, all uh, of the BIPOC community and also we have a Latinx uh, group in particular. We have a set of navigators that I want to get you in touch with. Uh, we are actually producing things in over 23 languages right now uh, and we have been doing uh, radio uh, interviews. Uh, Matias Valenzuela uh, goes on um, almost weekly to try. I know we. I know there's always more to do, but uh, let me get you connected so you can advise us where our gaps are. Because particularly with my contact tracing team, 50% of that team is bilingual. Uh, we have Spanish speakers. Um, we're hiring uh, and uh, working with the community, but. We have really valued organizations to bring the organizations in to literally guide us in how we're doing our work and particularly in communications uh, around this. So I will appreciate getting you plugged into that. Yeah, we'll make sure to connect you because um, Angie and her organization have been really critical connection points with the Latino community, uh, not just on the east side, but all over. Uh, for uh, masks, for information, for financials, so they, they, they are really tuned into the community here and they can be super helpful if we can provide resources. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. And by the way, that question gets replicated for all kinds of different communities and we know that, uh, that we're, we're reaching out to as many as we can. We are coming right up to the end, you all, and I know I didn't get to all the questions. I didn't get to various ways to help seniors access if they can't use the internet. We're, we, we are keenly aware of that. And in fact, one of my colleagues today was referring to it as the digital divide. And, and by that, he meant that the folks who most need to get connected to information and to appointments are today because some of them are quite older or have uh, some kind of disability, uh, very likely to be the least able to access all the technology to get it done. We're keenly aware of that, that that is a gap that we need to work on. And you all have pointed that out tonight. Um, I've seen a lot of anxiety about second doses because that feels like a ticking clock. I got my first dose 
and I'm trying to get set schedule for my second dose and I can't get any information. That that's got to be very anxiety. And let me let me just quickly, if I may, say something about that. I know we're almost at I know we're almost at time. (laughs) Um, Dr. Fauci uh, has come out and tried to relieve people's anxiety by saying that they've set those parameters as to when you're supposed to get the second dose. But he wanted to reassure people by saying that if, if it took a little longer, and in fact, they're looking at, you know, it can be six weeks, it's, it's going to be, we're going to get it, it done. So I, I, um, we're, we're going to have to have more conversation around that, especially if we don't get more vaccine infusion in here, because I don't want people to worry about that like they're outside of this narrow parameter and then it's all is lost. That's not, it's not going to be like that. Right. Well, this has been very educational. I hope you see, and Patty, I know you're focusing on talking to us. I hope you see there's a lot of appreciation being written in the chat and people saying thank you for all your efforts. I want to share that. And, and your team, I know they have been working night and day for a year and it'll go on for a while more. I want you to know that your efforts mean so much to all of us. We know you're out there trying to help us get through this. And even though there's bumps, we're all experiencing them together and we're all working on them together. Thank you so much. Um, Those of you who did not get your questions answered tonight, I hope you have my email. I'm gonna put it in the chat here. We won't hang up right away at seven so that people can jot things down if they need to. But really, if you just, Google Claudia Balducci, you're going to get me or you're going to get some kind of an epidemiologist in Italy who might have good answers too. So um, please feel free to follow up with us if you feel that you didn't get what you needed tonight. We couldn't cover everything. And by, and also there's just not answers to everything. But uh, we will probably, uh, can, well, we'll definitely continue to put out information via our weekly emails. When you, uh, when you go on online or email me, you will uh, see that there's a, a link to sign up for the weekly emails and we're happy to sh- add anybody to the list. Uh, we put things on social media and we will probably do another one like this in a little while, you know, probably not soon because there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of pull on poor Patty's time and I am not the expert, but we will really work to make sure that we are communicating with you all. And you hopefully know where to find me, uh, your representative, and I am. I will do everything I can to, to be a conduit for good information. Please stay safe, please stay healthy, please wear your masks and continue to you know, observe really good public health uh, practices and habits. We're gonna get through this, we're gonna help each other, and I just, I, I value you all and don't be a, don't be a, a stranger. Be in touch with us. We're here to help you. Thanks again, Thank Alex, you. for setting it all up. Thank you, Ann Berkland, for being the uh, the expert behind the scenes. And we'll uh, we'll we're gonna call this a night. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night.